Hello, folks, and thanks for listening. I have a uh, great guest today. Maggie Williams is the founder of Skip Town. She was my second guest on the podcast very graciously. Uh, I've recently been re-interviewing my guests who have pivoted their business due to COVID. Uh, her story is great in general, but I think the reaction to the COVID pandemic and lockdowns makes the story even more interesting and instructive. Maggie, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. I hope that these podcasts aren't indicative of just like a post-traumatic event globally. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not the theme. <laughs> well, maybe it's maybe the theme is it's just after a name change because you're <laughs> on your third name now, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. We do rebrands well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're getting good at it. Yeah. <laughs> So can you tell the listeners what the original vision and strategy for Skipper was? And I believe before that it was Waggle even. Yep. So we were the Waggle company and then Skipper and then Skip Town. Um, in the beginning, the origin of, of the company was really to solve a need um, for, for people with dogs looking for quality controlled um, dog walking services by people that they trusted. Um, so we started the company in 2016. I was the first dog walker. Um, I have two dogs. My husband and I have two dogs and really couldn't find an option um, in the market that really satisfied our needs. And so we started this company. Shout out to Seb. He just had a birthday, didn't he? Happy birthday, Seb. Yep, 33. <laughs> I, ju I just poured you an Angel's Envy rye whiskey. It's a delicious whiskey, by the way. Thank no you. no pressure. I see you've got a beer. Already, so. <laughs> it's good. I have two hands, so this works. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so the, the original vision is to do a dog walking service, digitally enabled. Um, you've got a path to scalability inherently. Um, just for the listeners who don't know, because I think it's a very interesting story, you raised a round of funding that by any measure was was, was a, a great round of funding. Um, it's that mythical, I believe, $750,000 round that nobody seems to be able to raise. Is that roughly right with, with what the first round was? Yeah, it was. And yeah, we so oversubscribed <laughs> and took in nine hundred. Yeah, okay. So, so I, I hear more entrepre would-be entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs tell me that they're going to raise 750000 for their first round, and almost nobody ever does. So k kudos. But it was an interesting occurrence right after that. <laughs> How long was it before SoftBank announces their announcement and WAG? <laughs> yeah. Right before we were raising our second round <laughs> yeah we get that no and you know it's funny when i saw it i was like this is great this validates the market um and for anybody listening so uh wag which was a marketplace model still exists i think kind of we're not sure <laughs> wag uh raised 300 million dollars from softbank so 750 000 mm -hmm. even if it's oversubscribed yeah. to 300 <laughs> They give me that little 150 bump. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I remember that day. Um, you know, it's funny, though. And it, we, it, we, we never, we always had clarity into that um, because we were obviously very intim intimately involved with a business that relied on going into people's homes. And we said from day one that we really sold trust. That's who we were, like outside of dog walking and having technology. And we were selling trust. And that's what mattered. And when you look at other models that don't, that aren't intrinsically built to to provide that kind of trustworthiness. I mean, it's a critical and fatal flaw, um, and and at least in our minds. And so when we saw that, we were like, "This is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to do something very different." Um, and you know, we believe in the kind of core assumptions of our business, which is that quality control, that selling trust, that investing in a team um, so you can invest in your clients, and um, it, that has carried us through to this day, and is you know why we've you know, figured out how to launch the concept of Skip Town and why we, I believe we've gotten as much traction as we have and why we're prepped now to scale um, has been on that, on those, that ethos, which is trust. Yeah, I had Alex and Dan in here last week and I understand you guys went out and had drinks afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but they, from 2U Laundry and they, they were pretty adamant at some point that they can't be the Uber of because there was a time when every pitch was where the uber of xyz industry but i think both of you understood pretty early on that this isn't an uber model and especially in your case i'm coming into your house i'm walking your dogs for most people maybe kids are a little bit more <laughs> uh necessary you know necessitate the trust factor but people love their dogs and i think that that's a pretty unique insight that you can't do it that way so you're saying that wag was were they more of the uber model then, um yeah so in the sense that you, it would it was a convenience driven model mm -hmm. um 
and and not but not necessarily had the infrastructure to support the quality control mm -hmm. which you know your tolerance is pretty low when it comes to somebody taking care of your home and taking care of your dogs you have to get that right mm -hmm. um but the, it takes a lot to get that right and it takes a lot not just to get that right once it takes a lot more to get that right five days a week if that's mm -hmm. how often you're coming into someone's home and so having those quality control checks doing the training selecting the right pet care providers you know in, equipping them and supporting the, um, the team so they know what success looks like and they can achieve all of that mattered and you know it's, and it's very you know and you see that this happen a lot where it's it's growth over everything mm -hmm. um, but not at the expense of quality when it comes to this when it comes to what we're trying to do and and that's you know we were never willing to sacrifice quality um, so 750k was definitely you know a pale in comparison to the 300 million. But I'll tell you, I think I think we've used it better. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, that's been a consistent theme with all of the SoftBank blowups is that they pushed people to grow at any cost, often at the expense of some common sense decisions, some quality assurance things, and it's 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 easy to beat them up hindsight is is 2020 um and they've definitely had some big wins as well but it seems to be a fairly consistent theme and maybe it's instructive for uh, entrepreneurs who are thinking about raising money that hey just because you have an investor who's pushing you hard who's offering more money than you think you need i think everybody should raise more than they need but i don't think you raise 300 million <laughs> into uh, uh, you know what was an unproven service at that point there may be a point where you need to hyperscale this thing but raising 300 million that early in any company generally seems like a recipe for some bad bad habits to form i think that what you just said nailed it i think it's the un it was the unproven part of it and it's not just wag it's any company that doesn't truly have product market fit mm -hmm. and we felt pray to that too i mean we pivoted for uh, for reasons that made more sense because of the the pervasiveness of the need the the willingness to, to pay um the urgency like all of that 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 in my mind defines what product market fit is we had to it took time to learn what that was and if i had put 300 million dollars toward a dog walking company when we started it would probably wouldn't have been successful because we just hadn't had that learning that growth that learning curve and it, that necessitates time and experience so i i think you're completely right i think it, it you know e handing somebody 300 million dollars at the wrong time is um is disastrous yep. and knowing that right time is the hardest is a the hardest thing to, a to do absolutely so i want to talk q1 2020 I think I spoke on a panel with you as we were in 20, 2020. Uh, what what was your progress and what did you think 2020 was going to look like? So Q1 2020, we had just signed the lease for our first location, our first skip town location. So we were very excited um, to be officially moving forward um, in, on construction in a couple months. We were finishing up raising um, the the financing round for that for that skip town. So we had you know had investors and we had had mo most of it committed and so we were confident right because we you know we saw where this is going we had a premier spot in you know, one of the most dense urban areas in charlotte um and then our dog walking was doing really well we were at about 240 walks a day so we were at about a million dollar run rate you know and we were anticipating growing twofold that year um just in dog walking alone and that was going to parlay really nicely as part of the service lines that we were then going to offer at skip town you know we had a core group of team members who were trained that we were also excited to flex into our skip town space to train them on on, on the other service lines that we were going to offer so it was just it was all just gearing up to make this this transition and and of course having the revenue to support the investment that we were making um in hq to be able to pivot from a dog walking company to a daycare boarding and bar um mm -hmm. with retail and retail you know brick and mortar at its core um yeah we were making decisions to invest to to support that growth is how we were thinking about it so do you have an exact moment that you said oh shit, this is going to be a big deal uh, for me it was like so much of America the night the NBA canceled its season. March Madness was canceled. For me, it was personal because I 
do an annual pilgrimage to Vegas for the March Madness. And two weeks before they canceled it, someone asked me, are you going? And I was like, hell yeah. And even after they canceled it, I was like, well, I may still go to Vegas. So that's what an idiot I was and how much I had my head in the sand. <laughs> By the way, that's good whiskey, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> so, so after you're done with that, okay. I'm going to give you the same brand, Angel's Envy, but okay. the bourbon and see which one you like better. All right. <laughs> so so uh was there an exact moment where you said oh shit like I, I this is maybe a bigger deal than i thought it was or i'm gonna have to shift gears a little bit it, i mean it, it sounds like you already were underway with a pivot and had already realized that you needed to um take a different approach to going to market but was there a, so it isn't like you had to change your business model and, and rip it up but was there a moment where you said i'm gonna have to really really pay attention to this yeah, so it sounds like our moments were this happening at the same time because I was in California when the NBA shut down. I was there for a, a conference that was related to work. And I'd flown out there, and I was supposed to spend a couple days, and it was my first day there, and the NBA got canceled. And I come out of the conference, and everybody's kind of like, you can tell, it's just like, ah, oh, something, this doesn't feel good. <laughs> and I remember in the span of an hour, I had gotten, I got calls from three of my three investors that were carrying about a half of the round that had committed, we were going to close in the next 10 days. It had just been like formality why we hadn't closed, but it was you know, four, 10 days out to fully close everything. And I, had, I got calls within an hour from three of my major investors who said, who had international deals so that their, their professional business was tied to the international markets. And they all called and said, you know, separate from each other, shit's on fire. We, uh, we can't commit to this round anymore. We don't know what's, go I don't know what's going on. We're not going to be able, I'm not going to be able to, pull, to, to come into this round right now. And that was the, that was the moment where mostly, because I mean, the fine, we just bought the financing bottomed out and, you know, it was, I was also in California and I had this, you know, instinctually I was like, I got to get home. I got to get back to the team. And so I booked a red eye flight that night and I, Flew all night. Was it San Francisco or LA? <laughs> yeah, San Francisco. Okay. So I came back, um, and I I showed up. I was I, I think I landed at like five thirty in the morning, and I texted the leadership team, and I was like, "Come into the office as soon as you can. We have some we have some things to talk about." And so I think they all came in around like six six thirty because I'm sure everybody was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> and I just we sat down and I said, "The world is changing." Anything that we were, we no longer are, and we have to figure out who we're going to be, and that's going to be dramatically different than what we thought, and let's get to work and figure this out. And it was that, I think it, it was that moment, it was that whole red-eye flight where I like couldn't sleep, and I'm just like, like just staring at the back of the, of, the, of the chair in front of me, thinking like, what does it mean to be in a wartime scenario? Like, what is this going to take? And I think over the next couple months, and you know, especially initially in, and then as it's kind of has written out, it's become very apparent to me how important like defining a goal and and getting and rallying everybody around whatever that goal is at that time and what i see the that you know nba closing down as like the pivot point between us being in more like a peacetime scenario and then moving to a, a wartime scenario and in a peacetime scenario you can be you, know, you can be creative and you can take broad brush strokes with how you go to market and do all these experiments and and then when you go to wartime it's like there is an existential, there's a threat in front of you and nothing else, like, and nothing else matters but getting around that threat and through that threat. And at that moment, it became about, like, the goal was we are going to cut costs. Mm -hmm. We're going to stop the hemorrhaging. We are going to hone in on critical path work and we are going to disregard everything else. And that's, and that's what we did. And that's what we did really up until we launched Skip Town. <laughs> you know, like. well, it, it's interesting that you word it that way because I, I just think back to, or not think back, but I think about um, in our stress response systems as humans, we've evolved systems that if a lion is chasing you, you shut down your reproductive system, you shut down your digestive system, you literally shut down everything that isn't core to getting away from that fucking lion as fast as you can, right? And it's that that's what you did. And I do wonder um, with with a lot of these type of scenarios because most of the companies I talk to that have done well, they went and they did cost cutting. That I suspect if you asked them, they would say we probably should have been doing this anyway, but we weren't forced to do it. And 
And so a lot of companies have actually thrived because of the fact that they were forced to shut down those other systems and pay attention to that survival instinct. So it is, I, I think it's something that hopefully, you know, years from now when all of this is behind us, we recall, hey, maybe I should look at cost cutting. Maybe I should really focus on what market I'm going after. Um, do you think you'll take those those type of lessons forward with you? Or do you think it's just such an, a, a, an extreme uh, event that it's, hey, we're going to do this one time and then we're going to get back to the way we used to be? No, I, I agree. I think it's conditioning. And I mean, we were like, we were scrappy like that in the very beginning. I remember when we before we raised our first round and we, we got an SBA loan the first time around, which our house is leaned on. Like I remember we put all like all the personal chips in the basket to get this financing. We were two weeks away from like not being able to make payroll. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling that way at that point, like what can we do to draw this out to give us more time? Mm -hmm. So, and, and then, you know, things get lighter and it's like you, you have more cash in the bank and it's, it can very easily just, you become a little bit more lax. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons that our, um, it's one of the reasons that one of our core values is ride the scooter in the rain. And it is, it's, it's one of our core values because from the very the beginning, my husband and I shared a car, one car, and he was, he needed it for work. And I took the scooter to go do dog walks. Uh, and so there were times when it would rain and I'd get caught in the rain. And I was like, well, this sucks because I'm on a scooter <laughs> in the rain. And it was just this reminder that like, this is what it takes. Like, being scrappy, mm -hmm. like doing what it takes to kind of get to an end point. And that's the core value because we're, we still, you know, and even through the pandemic, and it's always good to have that reminder of like, you, you looking at your time and your money as your, your finite resources and taking advantage of them and doing right by them and being very intentional with how you use them um, is everything. And I think the pandemic was a wake up call on how to um, remember that and remember what matters and realize how creative you can be within a bind um, and how much you can do on a lot less. Um, and the, t and, you know, and to a credit to the team, like they stood up to that challenge immediately. Um, I remember cutting things, cutting costs, where it was like any subscription that we like didn't use. I mean, it was just like ruthless, mostly and because I wanted to save as many jobs as I could. So the first thing we cut, which is any miscellaneous expense, you know, anything mattered. Like even if it was nothing, it mattered. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody just really kind of locked arms in in, a, in, in agreeing to that and, and kind of, um, you know, doing their part to help us figure out how we could, how we could, you know, Right yeah, the ship. and I think that's a great core value. Not to put you on the spot, but do you, what? What are the other core values? So we have a couple other ones. Um, so one of my favorite ones is head to weather, and it's a nautical term, and it means kind of aligning your ship with the external variables in mind, so that you kind of help the boat go in the right direction mm -hmm. using the tide and the, and the weather and the sun, and um, and we think about that all the time. And like during the pandemic, heading to weather was kind of who we became all like every day. It was like, are we doing what we need to be doing at this moment in time to stay alive? And given all these external circumstances that were happening. Um, and so that's a, that's a big one. Um, one of our other ones is, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, integrity above all. Mm -hmm. So going back to the idea of selling trust, you know, being worthy of the trust that you seek, um, going into people's homes, like mm -hmm. that being such a core part of our, of, of who we are and why we exist. Um, rooted in quality is another one. Like we don't cut corners. We've invested in our team from the very beginning. We hired them as W-2 as opposed to contractors, which was a very uh, atypical thing to do in a space like ours um, because it's more expensive to hire employees as opposed to contractors. But we wanted to be able to train them and you know, in, you know, really set our team up for success. And we didn't see how we could do that legally with contractors. Um, one of our other core values is create adventure from the inside out. And we started that because, you know, sometimes we, we were always looking for adventure, always looking to spot color in new places because we would be doing dog walks. And sometimes it was a 15 minute dog walk that would go around the apartment building. And we would do that, you know, five times a week. So how do you how do you create adventure from that if you're doing if you're on the sidewalk and the same sidewalk and it was always about find the adventure like spot the new colors figure out a way to like what's the what's the adventure behind this there's always something fun to find and new and exciting to talk about and that was a part of how we you know really messaged our message to our clients and and created the experience for the dogs um yeah that's those are, values. Those are great. I, I recommend anybody who's starting a company define your core values before 
they define you. <laughs> yeah. Um, be, because I, I do think if you can find a way to articulate core values that are actually core to who you are as a company, it helps people to understand how how they should behave. It, it helps. It's a great guiding light. And, and I think it just really, when times do get tough, you can come back to those core values and say, you know what, this is this is who we are and we're going to embody these. And if you can get that right, it's just a very powerful tool to have in the long run, for sure. So did, did you set those up on day one or was that something that you got to a certain size and realized, oh, shit, we need core values? <laughs> no, it was it was no. At the time, I did not think riding a scooter was very noble. So I don't <laughs> I don't think that. <laughs> no, that not at the time. But yeah, when we were early on, though, I would say when we 2017, I, you know, I remember doing it with, um, you know, our, our now head of operations and she was our head of HR at the time. And we sat down there and we, and we kind of crafted what we thought it could be. And we had pulled the team to figure out, you know, what like can you how do you define fine it was the wild company at the time how do you define us and what do you think makes us different and unique and where do we stand out and then we got a lot of buy-in and so yeah it was it was over a long period of time um after we had kind of gotten our base <laughs> all right so i want to talk about skip town you've already kind of alluded to it um just talk about what it is when and why you created the concept and did you view it as a pivot or as an evolutionary step yeah um so I like to think of Skip Town as being on a mission to make it easier and even more fun for pets and their people to live their best lives. And the way that we're doing that is an all-in-one ecosystem that um, offers the first ever tech-enabled quality-controlled services for dogs and for the people who love them. And we do that through um, a 24,000 square foot facility um, that has uh, a daycare boarding experience for dogs and then a uh, dog park that um, people can come to and hang out with their dogs and their friends. Um, and it's, we say it's kind of wrapped in this bow of uh, kind of like a, a country club, like a dog social club. So we say it's it's very it's higher end it's white glove it's meant to make you feel at home and relaxed um, it's like a backyard oasis for people coming to hang out with their dogs who get to run around off leash who feel comfortable you know who can really be who they want to be whether they're like you know the life of the party or if they prefer more to like watch the other dogs play you know everybody can kind of be who they want to be in a social setting. Um, and then on the pet care side, we just have this incredible team and we've really invested in the infrastructure to support a really quality experience for the dogs. And then for the, the clients, our, our mobile app supports all of these services. And so our clients um, can book services through our mobile app. Um, they pay through our mobile app. They get the visit reports through our mobile app. So the technology is really a really key underpinning to everything that we do which makes it not just convenient, but also scalable from a business standpoint. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that we've built a lot of technology for our team members too. So our team actually operates and is able to uh, execute on each dog's individual routine, whether it's daycare or boarding or dog walking, because the technology really prompts them and um, supports them in being able to do that. And so that's a big part of how we're able to execute our services and, and really deliver that high-end quality service. How much did you have to modify the original technology for the dog walking service to support the mission at Skip Town? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, tremendously, I would say, just like anything else in a company, like your processes, your systems, your tech sh should also be constantly being evolved and iterated. Um, and I, you know, and code being rewritten and rethought and built. Um, and so when we were a dog walking company, we had a very strong foundation. Um, both we had the client app and we had the team member app already. And that was a solid foundation plus a GPS routing system that we focused really heavily on because we were at that time really focused on um, we routing our team members. So routing 80 people a day and doing that efficiently and effectively in real time when people would book a visit, adding that to a person's schedule who's already in the area. So it was- it was That's a very tough challenge to solve without technology, by the way. Yeah, we, <laughs> oh my gosh, we used to stay up, we used to have somebody do a night shift mm -hmm. to do it because it would take that many man hours I'm to, guessing every they, day. I'm guessing they had to just model every single scenario and pick the best one. You would <laughs> put it in Google Maps. So we would put all the addresses in Google Maps and then we would, we would route 
we would do the routes based on the what the Google map what Google Maps would show because it would overlay all the addresses and then we would go through and then thirty percent of it would change the next morning because we you know same day scheduling it would all change it around again so yeah it was it was um it was something mm -hmm. so yeah we had to change it pretty significantly and and that's what we spent a lot of time our product and our tech team you know when we were not doing dog walking we were really focused when COVID hit from March to August on the tech, which we were going to do anyway. So, so I want to highlight how difficult this is. And may, maybe I'm missing the point, but like you just lost half your investors because you're building, you, you, they're, they're backing out of a building that you're trying to build where you're making changes and you're having to invest massive amounts of money into the technology infrastructure to go to where you know you, you need to go. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you justify that? In your head, do you have board members that you talk to? Do you have mentors, advisors? Like, how do you how do you get through that? Because that seems really fucking hard to me. Um, yeah, I mean, it. I mean, we did. So our our team. So in order to keep, so we had to. For, we. I mean, ultimately, we had to cut costs. We had to when we we lost all the dog walking revenue, um, and we had to do a reset on what 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 are we going to need? And I remember having our first. I remember calling an emergency board meeting. It was like that week that the NBA shut down and I flew back and it was like, we need to have like a come to Jesus on what's going on. And we had modeled out these different scenarios because no one had any idea. It was like one scenario, dog walking doesn't, you know, dog walking comes back in two months. Skip Town is delayed launching two months. Dog walking doesn't come back for four months. <laughs> Skip Town's <laughs> delayed two months. Like it was all these scenarios and it was really hinged on like, do we have revenue? Yes or no. And when, and is Skip Town delayed? yes or no, or how, and how long. And that decided everything because we were, you know, obviously once we opened Skip, and then if Skip Town opened, were we even going to be able to, like, were we going to bring in any ca like cash flow? Was it? Are people allowed to go to bars? Are we even allowed to open? <laughs> so it was just, it was just this big question. And so we had all these scenarios modded out and it was more like, what would be the well, plan? And I just want to point out, because I think you, you made the point, but people who aren't from Charlotte won't understand this as much, but the people from Charlotte will get it. South end, you're you're in the South End neighborhood, which is not a cheap is not cheap rent either. So, what kind of lease were you were, did you sign at this point? It was a twenty four thousand square foot lease um, in South End. In South End, oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we, sometimes you just ha and like we did, we laughed a lot because you just have to like the you just have to like come out of it for a second because it can get really dark and deep <laughs> too much where you just have to just say, okay, it's all going to be all right. We're going to figure this out. But the, the good thing about having a very expensive lease in South End is that you're teed up for success with a target demographic you're, you're mm -hmm. really trying to cater to. So you're and, like, and on South one End hand, apparently doesn't care about COVID as <laughs> I've seen for the, the last six months. Well, <laughs> some parts of it, we've tried hard to care. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you take it or leave But the it. residents don't. <laughs> yeah, the re yeah, I don't, I don't know. We, we felt lucky that we had so much square footage on our side that we've been able to operate mm -hmm. with social, socially distanced you know, protocols, but, um, but yeah, it's been tough for everybody. It's been tough for businesses and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure people who are, are trying to, you know, do their best, do the best with the information they have. Um, I forgot the question. No, no, you, you, you answered it. So <laughs> okay. uh, you're a, a maniac in, in a good way <laughs> about measuring KPIs and customer behavior. What has surprised you the most about Skip Town now that you've been operating? How long have you been operating it? Start, we open in August. Okay about six months um oh yeah we are we are maniacal about data <laughs> um, we do a daily stand-up every day and we look at like 300 data points mm -hmm. and we have the leadership team we go through it and we, it's great it's a pulse check and it's all it's all it is it's a pulse check and then we look at that really heavily and the learnings that have come out of that are just I can't even like, tell you how game-changing they've been so you know we were obviously really interested to see how opening in a pandemic would affect people's frequency of usage of the services. And we're still very interested to know how being in a post COVID world affects people's usage of the services, specifically cross usage and just frequency in general. And so we're a membership based model. And so we look really closely at, you know, what people take advantage of what services they use and how frequently. And I think two, two things that really surprised me, um, we had anticipated people would come to the bar and park about four times a month. So once a week is what we thought was safe. And, you know, we were kind of evaluating it based on. A Wait, four times a week? Sorry, four times a month. So okay. one time a week. Did I say that? Four I'm, times I'm a week. I'm not surprised to hear four times a week because I talked to 
Britton McCorkle from yeah. All American Pub, and that's they've built 15 restaurants on that idea. Are saying people come four times a week? Okay, no, <laughs> my, no, right. So four times a month, one time a week is what we had anticipated. Okay. But then what we saw was that people were coming more like one and a half to two times a week. Do so you serve we food? Tapping, so food trucks, yeah, we have okay. food trucks. Okay. Um, so like eight times a month, it was double what we <laughs> thought. And we were blown up. We were so excited by that because that was the whole concept. It was like, make this your neighborhood, your local, like it feels at home, right? Um, so really excited by that and, and really thinking about the membership model and what community means because of the frequency and how that is playing out. And then using, use, looking at the cross usage of services, which is really important to us because it validates the co-located services. So if you're using daycare and you're using barn park, how many people are doing that plus dog walking or just one of all of them? And so we've watched that over time and um, the cross usage from barn park users to daycare and over and back has been really fascinating to see and is really helping us inform how we grow because there's use cases where we grow the hub model, which is what we call the Skiptown CLT location, which is all the co-located services in one place. And then there are um, can other additional options to grow, which kind of are smaller footprints that lean more heavily into one service area. And so this would be in like a Winston Salem. Yeah, or a yeah. We we a like in this, we like that. ourselves a Top Golf and Top Golf construction like costs range between eight and eighty million dollars. So it's a huge wow. differences in like the wow. in the scale and the scope of what they build. And we think that there's an opportunity in a Winston Salem or in an, in another kind of if it's not super urban, it's if it's more suburban that. It's a different, it's a little, it's a different layout. It caters to a different group, but it maybe leans more heavily into one service line or the other. And we're figuring that out by really tracking the usage across different service lines with our core location. And that's been, that's been really fascinating to see. And we're excited to see how that plays out after COVID. Because we, we anticipate there will be a change um, in behavior once people are back to work, which, you know, no major employer has gone back to office work. So we anticipate a pretty big increase in demand once all of those people who are still at home and all the people who were at home without dogs before COVID, but now have a dog, hmm. come back out into the workforce, and you know, and you know, and and are no longer you know working from home. That, that's really need interesting. Services. Yeah, I recently had um, Stu Brower on, who owns Urban Movement and a couple of gym related yeah. businesses, and he, he said that he was very fortunate because he was very proactive. Um, in, in, in the pandemic about uh, finding ways to create uh, online content that people could use. He would lend you out his equipment and he ended up only losing 3% of his, his uh, subscribers, if you will, um, as a result of that. But then when they were able to reopen, the demand was, <laughs> the demand was just double what it was before because everybody was ready to get back. So yeah. I think that there are going to be a lot of businesses who find that people are ready ready to get out there and do it. I, I mentioned to you bef when we were talking before this interview, I'm getting married May 29th and, and our wedding planner was like, well, you know, normally you would expect this many people with COVID. It could bounce one direction, which is that there's less people who show up because they're afraid of the disease. It could be that you're getting near the end of COVID and people can see the light mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel and yeah. we just want to get out there and party like it's 1999. Get so. that catering budget ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, you hit right on the point of where my head goes. I don't know about my fiance. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, if you hear it, Victoria, he's joking. <laughs> so, um... So I had Alex and Dan from 2U on recently, who, by the way, you introduced me to. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, they really view the bricks and mortar retail experience and customer is very distinct from the digital delivery customer. How would you compare and contrast your views on how the two work together for, for Skip Town? Because you, you have a, a, I don't want to, it's not too similar, but you do have a digital experience and you do have the skip town. Are they, did they overlap? Is the Venn diagram very different than Alex and Dan's? Cause theirs is two completely different circles. Well, I'll tell you how they compare and they compare in two key reasons. The first is it's still very heavily service-based, right? So whether mm -hmm. it's a service inside your home or a service inside our facility, very heavily, you know, quality controlled services, trained professionals, um, a big emphasis on, on a large, you know, t work, a large team. Um, 
so in that aspect is very similar. And then I would also say the way we've designed it, technology is even more, you know, a play, if not, it's not, it's the same, if not even more when it, as it was for dog walking. Um, so the, the technology kind of underpinnings and, and the integration they, they of both, our app. Yeah. And, and to your point, they both said that in, the in store experience doesn't rely heavily on the app. There's just not a lot of crossover in their case, but in your case, it sounds it's like it's, it's more the same. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. If not, if it's more because there's more services and now integrating all those services inside of our app that makes it easy for people to, to move back and forth between them. Yeah. So technology is even more of a, a forefront now than it even was, but mostly just because we're upping, like we went from one service business to like a five service business. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would say the way that contrast is, uh, Skip Town, the, the, and the cool thing about Skip Town and the concept of Skip Town is that it really doubles down on community. And that's something that we had digitally, right, for dog walking, but you didn't have the shared, you know, experiences from being in the shared places that Skip Town does. And that community, both the human community, so the people coming to hang out with their friends, and the dog community, so the people coming with their dogs, so their dogs can hang out with their friends, is like one of the coolest parts. And, and I think one of the reasons that it's just, we've found really strong growth and traction because I think people really resonate with that. Mm -hmm. And because I think community matters so much more when you're in the same place at the same time. Um, and that's what Skip Town is. Very cool. So knowing what you know now about the pandemic, would you do anything differently in 2018, 2019? I mean, you were already on your way to skip town as a model, but are there things that you would have done differently? You know, that's always a funny question because I, I never know how to answer that because I part of me always thinks like you need the time and the experience to learn the things you learn, to make the decisions you make, to get to where you are. And so part of me thinks like if we had tried to rush any of that, kind of like your $300 million, you know, investment example, you would blow up because you just like hadn't had the time to really like piece it together and the learnings that are required from that time. And like, we wouldn't have known that dog walking could scale and the, and the hard parts about scaling dog walking is we were in three markets by the time we realized we should pivot to skip town or we wouldn't have figured out that like apartments were, you know, the focus and how to, we, we built three facilities and apartments before we opened to skip town that like kind of led us to what a, what, what a brick and mortar concept could be and how we could be impactful there. So part of me thinks we really need that time. I will say that like, I mean, it's, you know, now it's, it's true and it's in my mind all the time. And it, it took me, you know, time to really get that it get this was how important finding the right team is mm -hmm. like finding your a players, finding the people that are going to, you know, be able to, 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 you know, come and build this company with you and take it to the next level. And I think having clarity on the role that you need and who is the best, who would fit that role and how to find them, like to all day, right? I think about how far we've come and I think about the the, the people that are involved in this venture um, on the team specifically that have really like have gotten us here. And I just can't, I, you know, not finding them would have been a, such a mistake and finding them sooner probably would have been better. Like, and I just think about how important the team is at all times. And so whenever I think now about future roles, it's always goes back to how important having those people on the team are. And then conversely, or on the other side of the coin, making sure that if people aren't a fit, that they, you know, that you, you recognize that quickly mm -hmm. and that, that you, you kind of, you know, you, you make, you make sure that the people on the team are meant to be on the team and are and are and really providing you know a critical function to what you're trying to do. Um, that that's the hardest part for me because you want people to succeed. You want to think, okay, they're not working out. It's my fault. What do I change? And then you change three different things, and then you've pissed everybody else off on the team because <laughs> they're like, why is this person still on the team? And it, it's. It, it's hard. It, anybody who's never had to fire somebody, it, it, it's, it's just one of the hardest things in the world. But it, 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 it's, it's harder not to fire them and to look the other people in the eye and say, I want to hold you to this standard, but not these other people. Was that something that came natural for you? You're 
I mean, I think what comes natural to me is is asking a lot of questions to people who are smarter and have yeah. done have done more things, and then listening to them. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you know I've learned from a lot of great mentors and investors and and people who have shared those lessons and have said this is how you get some this is how you communicate effectively. This is what you know having an open communication channel means and being transparent and also setting up standards and saying, hey, we're not hitting the mark here. Let's give ourselves. Do you agree? What is it going to lo- look like to fix it? And let's give ourselves a 30, 45 day window. And if it doesn't get better, then this isn't going to be a right fit. And like, you know, putting like that string of, of, of actions together was something that like, you know, you think about over time and it, maybe it becomes more naturally because the more times you do it, that's kind of like, okay, well, the, the, the nervousness of like not knowing what you're doing um, goes away and just gets funneled to something else, you know, <laughs> and you're just constantly throwing those like nervous bubbles of, I don't know what I'm doing to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, t- I totally agree with that. So what were the biggest lessons you've taken from 2020? Um, Um, being, being goal oriented, Hmm. making sure the team knows what you're trying to do and making sure they know what success looks like for them to get to those goals. Okay. Um, data being just having a pulse on the data and learning from it and not thinking of failure as failure. Um, I like have a, you know, I I love, I love when things don't work out the way that they're, that we thought they would, because it's like, well, good. That's where we learn. Yeah. Right. And I agree. F- failure is information. Yes, failure is information, and it's like an opportunity to just do something different or learn from something you thought you know, learn from something. Um, and we just did it. You know, and it, when you do it enough, you're like, well, whatever. <laughs> I, <don't laughs> know. I guess we're like still here, so couldn't be that bad. Um, and yeah, and like having having the right team in place, and just like attitude is everything, and everything is attitude. And I think so much of things that we approach personally and professionally is like how we view it. And how we decide, like how we decide to view it, and so just in making that conscious choice to just decide how I'm going to feel <laughs> is like a big part of how it's. It's just I, somebody said this recently, and it stuck with me. It was like nervousness and anger and excitement. It's all just energy, mm-hmm. right? And if you think of it as just energy, you have the agency to redirect that energy in any way you want. And if you can, and if you, if you want to, you can learn how to redirect energy from a feeling that maybe isn't productive or doesn't make you, isn't good for you into a feeling that is. And that like conscious choice is something that I just personally just feel is, is very, um, validating. And it makes me feel like, again, like no matter what, like no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Like the worst case scenario is never that bad. It's yeah. like Seb and I say that all the time when I was like, let's lean our house on this skip town loan. And like Seb's like, let's do it. And you're like, because <laughs> what's the worst case, right? Like it doesn't work out and we lose everything and that's okay. But we at least would know that we tried something and it mm-hmm. wasn't the right thing to try. It's like, it, you know, it's all the way you, it's all the way you look at it. No, I think I, I would call what you're talking about reframing. And I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks about reframing and about how do you manage stress and how do you manage happiness and I think that reframing is one of the most important things and one of the things I admire about Victoria my fiance is that she meditates every morning when she wakes up no matter what it doesn't matter what kind of day she's got planned it doesn't matter what kind of night she had the night before every morning starts with 10 to 20 minutes of of meditation and I, and I think that that uh, meditation is one technique for doing that reframing where you just start to realize my hopes, my fears, my dreams, my aspirations, my stress, they're all created in my head and they're not good or bad. They're just something that I can observe yeah. <laughs> and I can move on from. Uh-huh. And, uh, it's, it, I, yeah. I, I understand how important that is, but I still, I, I don't meditate every day. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Do, have you found things like that that help you out with dealing with these type of things? Or Yeah, for me, it's just being outside. Mm-hmm. Like, I just have this, like, I just love to be outside. Like, it just gives me, like, immediate calm just to, like, see the sky and, like, Mm -hmm. just, like, hear outside noises. Um, Oh, hearing a bird chirp or... Yeah, yeah. (laughs) yeah, All, like, I do. It's just, like, it just puts me in a happy place, which is funny because, like, going through the whole pandemic and we're all stuck at home, like, we have this patio on the back of our house and, like, that's where I worked. And it was just kind of a running joke because, like, my office was the patio every day thank goodness that like that one silver lining of the pandemic was that it happened in the spring when we could like <laughs> you know 
be outside. <laughs> At least there was that. That was my coping mechanism. I lived in Dilworth at the time and mm-hmm. I could like walk to three different parks. Freedom, yep. um, Freedom Park, uh, Sedgefield Park, and uh, uh, there's one on Park Road. Ladder? I don't Ladder Park? Ladder Park. It was Ladder Park, mm-hmm. exactly. And um, and, and it was just wonderful. It was. There's no... There's nothing that happens to you from a stress perspective that can't be solved by more outdoor time. For me, personally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's great. So I think you've hit on this a little bit, but can you maybe talk about how scalability and growth strategy change with, with Skip Town? Yeah. Um, I think in, in a ton of exciting ways, we are now like diving you know, head first into a brick and mortar concept that has, you know, retail, it's retail expansion, it's, um, it's location based, you know, the financing structure and you know, strategy is totally different from what we were doing. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, we are really kind of rounding out what we think is makes a skip town viable from like a physical location standpoint. And because we consider ourselves destination retail, you know, and and the kind of demographic that we attract is is very accretive, is very uh, valuable to a lot of the other tenants and landlords who are in our areas and and in the kind of area we're in, there's a lot of cool synergies. And there's a lot of new partnerships that open up because of what we do. Um, And so it's been a it's been a really steep learning curve. Um, we've, we've had a blast, like learning about how this works and bringing in, you know, ex- having a really strong external team that can help guide us in which we do. Um, and that's been, a, and that's been great. And then seeing opportunities and, and really kind of figuring out and, and seeing physical spaces and what, and like imagining what they could be and if they could be a skip town, um, has been, you know, a big change in, in kind of what we, what we had been doing. Are we on to whiskey cool. number two? I'm so excited. By the way, I'm, I'm glad I'm you po- saw that because I was like, should I interrupt him and be like, I don't nope. have more whiskey? <laughs> so for, for those who are wa- <laughs> watching on YouTube, first of all, how dare you? There's more than audio. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you that I just poured the Angel's Envy uh, bourbon and I had, do you know Bobby Robinson? No. Okay, Bobby is a, an attorney. Sorry, in town Bobby. Who <laughs> Shout out to Bobby. Um, we, we acquired a technology firm that he developed for a law firm that he owned, and um, I let him taste both of these, and he thought one was better than the other. Okay. And then he changed his mind later. Oh. So, but I'm so I'm giving you a taste test. You're okay. now tasting the Angel's Envy bourbon. They call it Angel's Envy because they, they make bourbon. They they cure it in, um, in in these oak barrels the oak barrels expand and contract when they expand when they contract you lose a little bit to evaporation and that's called the angel's share so this brand calls the angel's envy this is the part that the humans get that the angels don't get but you first tasted okay. the uh, and the, the other one the was rye. what what was the other they're one both called? angels envy but you tasted the rye and this is the bourbon and that is a gigantic pour so if you need help with yeah it. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say I was like <laughs> I have to call my like DD later. To come get me. <laughs> like, hey, Seb, remember I told you I was doing that podcast? I'm drunk. <laughs> Sorry, Seb. <laughs> or, or maybe you're welcome, Seb. Sure, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to try it. Dun, 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 dun. Now we get the real answer. It's going to take a second. I don't know if you remember what it tasted this like. This one. So that was Bobby's original answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if I feel how Bobby feels. I think I'm... No, this was good. This was... It was smooth. I feel like... This one is definitely smoother. The other one is a little bit spicier, which is, I think... I, I think that's what Bobby latched on to. Eventually, mm-hmm. he was like... But he tasted it in the other direction, and he was like, definitely the bourbon's better. But then he came up with the rye. How but, long did it take him to change his mind? It took him a good five or ten minutes of, oh, okay. of talking. Oh, okay. So it was... Okay. So, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. I'll sit on it. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you and know. And again, I apologize for the three finger pour there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. It'll carry um, me out. So I'm curious how hard it was going from managing a software platform and a network of dog walkers to adding managing a construction project because those are very different skill sets. Can you maybe comment on how you adapted? And you, you, you obviously planned on this before the pandemic. So, so you thought a lot about it, but what, what, what was going through your mind as you, as, as you took on this new, and, and again, managing a construction project is nothing 
for uh, n- nothing for the MIG to undertake, right? Yeah, I mean they're definitely they're definitely very d- the different. Um, they're very different scopes, but at the same time, they're very use they're user experience based. So it's like with with technology platforms similar to like physical spaces. It's how is the user going to experience this, and what are they going to get out of it, and how can you make it easier for them to get what you want out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we so we, we took the same approach. Um, and uh, Nikki, my head of product, is you know incredibly uh, talented in being able to envision both how technology can can be brought to life to support user experience in the same way that she is talented in being able to see how physical spaces can come to life to support a mm-hmm. user experience. And so with her leadership um, and with the support of our incredible external team, of which there were many, including a project manager, a local architect, we had a GC, we had um, civil engineers and zoning consultants and this whole group of people who could help us you know, fill in the gaps. Because there's a lot of things that were like, well, this would be the idea way to do it. And then you'd be like, you can't because the slope goes this w- this much down and that is not ADA compliant. So you can't do that way. Wow. So there was a lot of like things we wanted to do and then fitting that into the world of, of, of uh, legal and um, able to do, which was great. It was like a big puzzle. Um, and I, I now have so much appreciation for like every building I see. It's like how those get off the ground, just knowing all the things that we kind of came up against. And I'm like, oh my God, is this going to be the thing that's going to sink us? Like, you know, is the, the water line from the back of the building to the front of the building and it being a two inch pipe versus a one and a half inch pipe? Like, is that going to be the end of us? And there was conversations for like, it could be like, there's things that happen that Mm -hmm. seemingly minimal that derail an entire project and don't even you know really stop it from continuing um so that was exciting (laughs) to to have that just like also happening that seems exciting in a masochistic (laughs) way yeah (laughs) exciting is like well if the global pandemic wasn't enough (laughs) like let's couple like us going through this for the first time and like um, but it, you know, it, it came, it got, we got it through and we had, you know, and I credit that to having the right people to like help marshal it through and, and an, an idea at the end of the day that everybody was passionate about, you know, getting launched. Um, but it has made us very sensitive and aware of what it's going to take going forward. And we took a lot of copious notes on that. So we learned a lot from this experience at Skip Town CLT and we've taken, and we've, the, the learnings and the application of those learnings now going into our second and third location, which we're anticipating now, um, I can just see, I can see it growing and I can see the opportunity in the future where like, we just like catch everything as it comes. And it's just, I'm sure that, you know, there's always stuff you can't anticipate and that sure it keeps it spicy, but kind of like your other whiskey. <laughs> but for now, I feel very good about where we are and very confident about what we know and also confident in what we don't know and how we figure out um, how do we, how we find the information to, so get there. you mentioned the second and third location. I don't want to, I, I don't want you to reveal anything because I'm sure there are negotiations going on, but maybe, so I'm not asking what cities are you going to, but how do you think about the second and the third city compared to a Charlotte? Are they similar to Charlotte? Are they different cities? We are so excited to expand because we see being able to provide a bigger impact nationally. We see ourselves being the front, the, the pioneer in this concept that's tech enabled that you know, co-locates all these services that makes it both convenient and qual and, and delivers a quality experience for, for people and for their dogs. And we just are very excited about the opportunity to grow it and to, to, you know, be a meaningful part of more people's lives. And when we look at where we're going, we look back at product market fit and, and the core assumptions behind what we've done. And we recognize we've only done one. So from what we've learned from that one, we are and looking, it's one where you live in the city and you know and the I live city. in the city yeah. and I've I, I right so we've had home team advantage right because we built a company and built some brand equity here but you know then I look back and say well we also did it in a pandemic and we pre-sold memberships for only a month and you know that will have a longer lead time going into a new market and hopefully we won't be in a pandemic so like that'll change things but we but even universally like despite you know growing up in Charlotte and having our foothold in Charlotte there is a need for this and i think that's what kind of like burns the fire for the whole team is like we see the opportunity we see the demand especially coming out of covid where all these people adopted dogs and the need for like and even when i in 2016 had two dogs and was like why is this so hard to find services that can like do do the job i want them to do i want it to do 
it's still there's still not a market a supply to meet that demand and we're we're coming after it and so scaling looks like a couple things it looks like replicating what we've done in charlotte um, because we have confidence in that and then it looks like um you know being really smart about the locations we go to and doing it fast where we want to get out there but not too fast where like the you know wheels come off the bus Mm -hmm. and that is a very special balance that like you only know like in hindsight (laughs) You know, so we're trying to make very definitive. I, I tend moves. to lean over the skis. Yeah, 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 I do too. <laughs> it's kind of like by nature, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but any people that like rein you in, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing, uh, or at least I do. Or kick me out. Yeah. Yeah, either, way. <laughs> <laughs> either way, who knows? Either. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just let that lie. <laughs> so. Talk to me about your communications during the pandemic. You've already kind of hinted at it, but there's there's talking to your investors. There's talking to um, your your employees. There's talking to your leadership team. Um, how did the various stakeholders handle the at times grim news that you were bringing to them? Well, it was grim news that was happening to everybody. So I think there was kind of like shared empathy there, um, and we. And uh, to my credit, but also to a little bit to my, probably a lot to my credit, but also, you know, because of, of, I'm sure, natural forces, we have gotten a great group of supporters, both investors, mentors, people who are in decision making roles around and in the company that just are very understanding and like want, you know, we have mutual, we are mutually aligned and um, our, you know, our success is their success. And so when this kind of initially happened and we, you know, when I called the board meeting and was trying to figure out like, well, what do we do? Where do we go from here? It was only solutions. It was like, let's get into solution mode, whatever we can all do to make this easier. And I think about all the people who were involved, you know, we, we ended up getting the financing, right? So I found the investors to mm-hmm. fill the gap. Our landlord is great. The whole thing. Asana was fantastic and made it much, it made it easier to, to succeed in ways that they didn't have to do, you know, and they did, they came to the table and they said, let's figure out how this is going to work for you. And let me, you know, again, because our success is their success. So they really shared in that. And we were just, you know, partially lucky and partially by design, you know, as much as it could be, we had to have a really strong and supportive group of people that in times of strife, um, really showed up for us. And that made all the difference. That, that's awesome. I think having that, you didn't call it a tribe, but I think of that as your tribe. Yeah. <laughs> having that, it, it sounds cliche, but like that makes all the difference in the world when you're in, in shitty times. Um, yeah. The people around you, it's easy for them to be good to you when times are good. It's, it's hard for them to be good. But like you said, when everybody's in this boat together, like you just have to figure it out, right? Yeah. There, there's no other no other way are, are there lessons to learn on communications in general as you go through a crisis because do you think that your communication mode changed in the crisis or, or maybe it was the same but are, are, are there things that you'll change as you come out of crisis mode and out of war mode and back into peace mode from lessons learned in war mode yeah i mean i think i've always really you know i think you can be empathetic but also direct and that's always been my kind of MO, but I, th- I think the way it changes, I've definitely, my communication style became more urgent, mm-hmm. right? There was a time sensitivity to everything. Um, and there was an overall sensitivity because, you know, what I was doing too, is just like, I mean, we furloughed a third of our back office team. We let go of 70 additional team members, dog walkers. Wow. And, wow. I mean, it was like, it was like hard persons, like personal stuff. Like it was personal. And I remember just being beaten down by it. And being like, this is the decision I'm making because it's the best thing for the company. And that's what I'm here to do. And then also just like reeling from the fact that like it was just it was just such a difficult thing to like do as a human. Um, so, you know, and you try to do that in, in you try to do that in the most respectful and the, in the best way possible. Um, at but a there's time no when great like, way to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's like, a, there's ways to do it and there are better ways than others, but you're right. Like it's, it sucks. It like sucks. it sucks. Yeah. It's just like flat out sucks. Um, um, yeah. And, it, and you can like justify it and, but it is, it's just like, it's part, it's part of the, the game and it's just, it sucks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, communication style, like if anything, I think there, there was a lot of, you know, kind of like the, the, 
relationship building that happens in a time that's you know formative for everybody mm-hmm. i kind of think about way with college i think that's why you have like really strong friends from college because you kind of go through this formative experience together that like you know you're living with them and you're like going like you're kind of doing all of these things for the first time and you are with this group of people and I think the military is the same way. Like I get that. I've never been in the military, but I've heard. Nor that have it, I, but I, but certainly but my friends share that share experience. Share that experience, yeah. right? And I think this was kind of like that. This was one of those formative experiences that, that when we went through together, we came out of it and we're like, wow, like we get to see people when their vulnerabilities are exposed and like the things that prop them up are, are taken away. And it's like, you can be there for each other and you can kind of, you know, exist through that. And that means something. Um, and I felt that for sure. And I think the team does too. So, yeah, I think if anything, you know, it's just we've gotten better through this. But, you know, it's, it's always kind of, I've always been a big believer in transparency as much as you can and, you know, direct feedback as much as you can and, and acknowledging positive things as much as you can. You know, like, I, I you know, I believe in, I believe in talking as <laughs> you, know, you can probably pick up on. <laughs> I pick it up. So do I, as you can probably guess by the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it's like John's chance to talk. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. No, that that that's great for sure. And I, I think the point about vulnerability is one of those things that we, I, I don't think that we appreciate how important it is to show your vulnerabilities because it it comes across as weakness often. But I think that it makes communication so much easier for people. But it's just it's just one of those hard things as a human to yeah. to, to communicate vulnerability. So I think that's a very powerful insight. Um, what a what a twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two look like for Skip Town. Um, well, growth mm-hmm. mode. We are excited to hopefully you know, and I, I say this as my mother and my grandmother have you know both gotten their COVID vaccines, so. You know, as we kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and we start to see what what is the world going to look like um, when we kind of come out of this and how is Skip Town going to how are we going to position Skip Town in a way to support people coming out of COVID who need our services? Um, it's very exciting and it looks like growth. And that's what we're kind of in the mindset for now. We are um, looking f- to launch two, no- two new locations by the middle of next year. So the middle of 2022, um, we have several sites, you know, l- that were targeting um and cities that we're looking at and um you know it's just it's it's growth mode right it's like taking something that was a proof of concept that's worked you know um in a petri dish and figuring out how to make it work outside of that dish and that's the next uh that's the next challenge to explore awesome so it's geographic growth there's no new there's no third rail or not third rail. That's yeah, a bad term, but I was like, what? <laughs> but, but there's no For third. For the next podcast. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, but but there's no third. There's no third. Uh, not even pivot because this isn't really a pivot. But there's there's no third delivery model. It's really like let's let's rinse and repeat in other geographies. Basically. It's refinement of this model. I mean, it's yeah. definitely additional services being incorporated. It's like slight tweaks and nuances. But I would say the focus of an ecosystem of a high-end experience-based model that you know that focuses on a, a location and has technology that supports it is the concept and that's you know after five years it's like we we are honing in on that we believe in that um we have product market fit and and, and, evid- and data to show that and we are like fearlessly moving forward in the world to to expand that awesome so you've mentioned the capital raises you've done. I think I heard there were two equity raises and then the debt round for building Skip Town. How different were those experiences? And were there others that I'm glossing over here? Yeah, they were different because we were in a different stage of the company. It was, it was like every new name, it was like a different round. Um, and But it was, you know, a every lot of... Every new name. Every new name. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like we new name, new, new financing round. Um, we had a lot of shared investors that are concentric across those different financing rounds. So that was cool. So there was consistency across that, which I think also is a testament to show that mm-hmm. even, you know, starting is something wildly different than where we are. We have still, you know, a, an investor base that has come in every round, right? Mm-hmm. So um, being able to rally people around around that and knowing that, hey, we're going to figure it out. <laughs> we're going to get there. Um, the the rounds, you know, I, I don't know if they've got, I feel like they've gotten, it's, it's, I don't want to say easier because that diminishes the work 
but there's more familiar territory. Okay. And it's kind of more of a, this is what I need to do to be successful and, and a comfort level with having that knowledge and confidence that when I was first like, ah, actually it was Alex and Dan who came over. I remember I'd be like, how do you raise money? And then be like, well, you need a pitch deck. Like, okay, what does that look like? <laughs> and I remember we like, they came over to Hookah and like, we like workshopped it and they how, were how great. How were they at the time? 24? <laughs> Probably. But they raised a big round of funding. Like, they no, was I'm, totally... I'm not surprised. I, I don't doubt that those guys can do anything that they want to do, but it's just funny that at it that is, age they were. Yeah, I was, I was probably 26. So it was like, you know, it was whatever. <laughs> no, they were, yeah, they, <laughs> but they had just done it. And I remember like, you know, I, you know, still admire them and I have, you know, admired like everybody in this entrepreneurial ecosystem that I've am close with and very much supportive of and it's fun to rally for them and get excited for the, their accomplishments and see everybody see everybody but but, but a debt round here. and and that's great i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut oh, yeah. you off but but a debt round has to be completely different because now you're talking to more of a banker than a than a dice roller right like a, a <laughs> yeah it's funny because the debt round yes the equity the debt round was is somewhat actually of a saint of a similar group who wanted equity, but we were only offering debt. Okay. <laughs> so it was like a, yeah. And it was because there was excitement for the concept. Like, I think it was just like, oh, I, I see what you're doing. Yeah. See, I see what you're, I see where you're going. So we could raise debt um, and we wanted to because we, we knew we could support it. And, you know, we did. And that was good. That feels great. That feels great to be able to be like, yeah, we carried this load and, and this interest and we can absolutely cover it. Um, so... It wasn't a super different group. I would say it, you know, it was, I didn't realize how, that, that, that uh, like our investors do debt on other, in other deals. Now, some were like, no, I only do equity, but there was a good number of them that were like, yeah, I've done a debt deal before. If that's what you're offering, I, I would definitely take a look. And um, so I think it was, yeah, so it worked out. Um, and then of course we got an SBA loan, which was, um, which was, you know, the crux to the whole thing. And so any PPP money or? We did get PPP money. Um, Any you, loan forgiveness guidance? And yeah, we got no. full loan forgiveness on the first round. Awesome. Um, yeah, which is great. And that went directly to our team, you know, to support our our um, labor costs. So, are, yeah. Are you allowed to use? Well, you don't have any um, 1099, though, so it doesn't matter because it's all full time. Yeah, that, that, that's when that, that decision pays off. Is yeah. When you, yeah. When you invest in. Yeah. We, had all, we have all full time team members. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So are there ongoing or shortly planned capital raises that you care to talk about or not? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, we are about to open another round um, to support the next three to five locations. So we will be finalizing details soon around that as I had a board meeting today and that was partially to discuss it. So yeah, we, you know, are excited about, you know, the opportunity to grow and realize that we have to, you know, figure out the right financing strategy to get there. And, you know, we have a good base to start with. Mm -hmm. And then we'll we'll go from there. But it's exciting to continue to like drive this company forward and see where it can go and and just can constantly just be reinvigorated about what we're doing and the need that we're filling and know that there is something really special here that if we execute well we could we could really we could really make a big difference to a lot of people. And I think the people who have been around you can sense that it's it's why it's awesome to have you in here in the studio. Um, before I let you go, just one more question you mentioned seb i know he helped you start the business what the fuck is seb up to these days <laughs> and how do i get him on the podcast <laughs> seb would love to come on the podcast so seb is kind of like the the, the renaissance man of of on like entrepreneurship because after he transitioned off of out of our company he went to um so grow and support a fire and water restoration company, which is what he does now mm -hmm. um, for a company called Sasser. So he um, is a partner at that company. And then in addition to that, he runs a food truck called Hula Whip. Okay. And it's what the, type of food? Um, it's Dole Whip. It is a soft serve ice cream um, made from pineapple. And we got our big launch in the summer of 2019 and then quickly <laughs> had a damper on the, on the, on the growth of, uh, of Hula Whip when COVID hit. But we are coming back into the world, and, and Seb is Seb. It's, it's Seb's baby. Um, is he cooking or is he driving or what? what no, the? he's well. He's both. I mean, I guess technically he's both. He's yeah. He's he's serving. He's driving. He's <laughs> um, yeah. It's really fun. It's it's at Hula Whip on Instagram, and um, yeah. If you want an event and if you want like a Dole Whip treat, um, and then you can bring your own rum, which is what I always recommend because that <laughs> stuff is a lot better. 
topped well, I'd, off. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to interview Seb. It, it's inter it's always been interesting the, the the dynamic between the two of you because you're you're obviously the more outgoing face of this organization, but I think that stopping there underestimates what somebody like Seb brings to an organization: the operational capabilities, the okay, I can I, I can. I, I can really analyze what's happening and figure out the right way to go. So I'm sure I'm sure that that was a challenge for you um, in some ways, Seb, moving on. But it was also probably in the long run, it, it's really hard to build a scalable business that has a husband and wife combination. Did you, did you run into that at all? I know we talked about this on the first podcast, but yeah, I mean, I felt like I lost my lifeline at work, but um, you know, I still had my lifeline at home, so. Mm -hmm. He was still there. And in, in, you know, in a lot of ways, he's still very involved um, and probably in a better way because he can kind of be involved without it, like, you know, out him feeling like it, you know, he, he has to be fully involved, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he hangs out at the office all the time. He's mm -hmm. known for kind of getting snacks and, and <laughs> stopping <laughs> by. <laughs> um, but the team loves him. And, yeah, I think he's like I, he's obviously like a big value to any group. And I am very lucky to get to call him my life partner. And I'm excited to see what other stuff that we do together professionally um, because it, it's a blast to work with him. Well, t t please tell him to call me. I, I'd, love, <laughs> I'd love to have him on. <laughs> I feel bad. We get to have all they the fun <laughs> drinking the bourbon. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I'll let him know. I'll be like, you missed out on like the, the whiskey tasting. Maybe John will do it for you. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> he might not get Angel's Envy. I mean, if you're not seeing, if you're Mainly not seeing the bottles, they're all empty. <laughs> And those aren't empty because we were alcoholics yeah. today. I just didn't stock up properly yeah. today. So I brought some beer. Yeah, it's great. We, yeah. got, we got all the alcohol and chess. <laughs> Different. Exactly. And shout out to Making Things Charlotte. Have, yeah, you, have you seen that uh, Instagram account? Uh, there's there's a gentleman who bought a, a 3D printer and he, oh, cool. he decided to, th to start 3D printing things that look like That's, Charlotte. And he came up with the chess set was his first genius. offering. But he's he, he, he Will made he make some, a skip town building. He probably be, would. I, okay. I guarantee you if you DM, slide in okay. his DM, okay. making things CLT. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm like searching now. All right. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, Maggie, this has been great. Thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Keep up the great work. And I can't wait for the third, um, the, the, the third interview for sure. Yeah. It'll be a blast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, John. All right. Cheers.